Ladies and gentlemen, please rise, announcing the entrance of the President of the Republic of Indonesia, His Excellency Joko Widodo, the Prime Minister of Cambodia, the Prime Minister of Lao PDR, the President of Myanmar, the Prime Minister of Vietnam, the Annual Meetings Chairman, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, the President of the World Bank, the Secretary of the International Monetary Fund and the Secretary of the World Bank. Presidents, Prime Ministers, Governors, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is my pleasure to call order the 2018 annual meetings of Boards of Governors of the International Monetary Fund and of institutions comprising the World Bank Group. I welcome all Governors representing all member countries. We are honored to have with us this morning so many heads of states, heads of governments, fellow governors, and distinguished guests. In particular, we are delighted to have among us His Excellency Joko Vidodo of Indonesia and their and Their Excellencies, Prime Minister of Cambodia, the Prime Minister of Lao PDR, President of Myanmar, and the Prime Minister of Vietnam. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I may ask everyone, please rise and join together for the moment of silence to honor the lives that have been lost in the recent devastating natural disasters. Thank you. Before calling the President Choco Vidodo to give his opening remarks, I would like to express, on behalf of all participants, our deep gratitude to President Choco Vidodo and National Committee Chair Minister Luhut and the people of Indonesia for their warm welcome and gracious hospitality. The government of Indonesia has put in the trinimous effort to host the annual meetings. I would also like to recognize the excellent collaboration between the government of Indonesia and the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank Group. I now invite the president to the podium.
Yang saya hormati Honorable Heads of State and Heads of Government Honorable Madam Christine Lagarde Managing Yang saya hormati Bapak Jim Yong Kim Presiden Bank Dunia Yang saya hormati Bapak Petri Orpo Chair of IMF Board of Governor Yang saya hormati Para Kepala Bank Sentral Para Menteri Duta Besar Dan Pejabat Tinggi yang saya hormati anggota delegasi serta Bapak dan Ibu hadirin yang berbahagia. Selamat datang di Bali, selamat datang di Indonesia, dan selamat datang di ASEAN. Bismillahirrohmanirrohim. Assalamu'alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Pertama-tama, atas nama masyarakat Indonesia, saya menyampaikan terima kasih atas perhatian, atas dukungan, dan atas bantuan dari Bapak, Ibu, Saudara-saudara kita dari berbagai penjuru dunia, untuk masyarakat di Nusa Tenggara Barat dan di Sulawesi Tengah yang menjadi korban gempa dan tsunami. Hal ini menunjukkan persaudaraan kita yang sangat erat, persaudaraan untuk kemanusiaan dan persaudaraan untuk menyelesaikan masalah bersama-sama. Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, Sepuluh tahun yang lalu, kita mengalami krisis finansial global. Berkat langkah-langkah kebijakan moneter dan fiskal yang luar biasa, yang membutuhkan keberanian politik yang besar, Bapak-Ibu, para pembuat kebijakan telah menyelamatkan dunia dari depresi global yang pada waktu itu sudah di depan mata. Untuk itu, kami menyampaikan Selamat atas kesuksesan Bapak-Ibu dalam mengatasi krisis finansial global tahun 2008. Setelah 10 tahun berlalu, kita tetap harus waspada terhadap meningkatnya risiko dan kesiapsiagaan kita dalam mengalami ketidakpastian global. Seperti yang disampaikan Ibu Christine Lagarde terhadap banyak masalah yang membayangi perekonomian dunia, Amerika Serikat menikmati pertumbuhan yang pesat, namun di banyak negara terdapat pertumbuhan yang lemah atau tidak stabil. Perang dagang semakin marak dan inovasi teknologi mengakibatkan banyak industri terguncang. Negara-negara yang tengah tumbuh juga sedang mengalami tekanan pasar yang besar. Dengan banyak masalah perekonomian dunia, sudah cukup bagi kita untuk mengatakan bahwa winter is coming. Hadirin yang berbahagia, dalam beberapa dekade terakhir, negara ekonomi maju telah mendorong negara ekonomi berkembang untuk membuka diri dan ikut dalam perdagangan bebas, dan ikut dalam keuangan terbuka. Globalisasi dan keterbukaan ekonomi internasional ini telah memberikan banyak sekali keuntungan, baik bagi negara maju maupun negara berkembang. Berkat kepedulian dan bantuan negara ekonomi maju, negara-negara berkembang mampu memberikan kontribusi besar bagi pertumbuhan ekonomi dunia. Namun, akhir-akhir ini, Hubungan antar negara-negara ekonomi maju semakin lama semakin terlihat seperti 
Game of Thrones. Balance of Power dan aliansi antar negara-negara ekonomi maju sepertinya tengah mengalami keretakan. Lemahnya kerjasama dan koordinasi telah menyebabkan terjadinya banyak masalah, seperti peningkatan drastik, harga minyak mentah, dan juga kekacauan di pasar mata uang yang dialami negara-negara berkembang. Hadirin yang terhormat, dalam serial Game of Thrones, sejumlah Great Houses, Great Families, bertarung hebat antara satu sama lain untuk mengambil alih kendali The Iron Throne. Mother of Dragons menggambarkan siklus kehidupan. Perebutan kekuasaan antar para Great Houses itu bagaikan sebuah roda besar yang berputar. Seiring perputaran roda, satu grid house tengah berjaya sementara house yang lain mengalami kesulitan. Dan setelahnya house yang lain berjaya dengan menjatuhkan house yang lainnya. Namun, yang mereka lupa, tatkala para grid houses sibuk bertarung satu sama lain, mereka tidak sadar adanya ancaman besar dari utara. Seorang Evil Winter yang ingin merusak dan menyelimuti seluruh dunia dengan es dan kehancuran. Dengan adanya kekhawatiran ancaman Evil Winter tersebut, akhirnya mereka sadar tidak penting siapa yang duduki di Iron Throne. Yang penting adalah kekuatan bersama untuk mengalahkan Evil Winter. Agar, agar bencana global tidak terjadi, agar dunia tidak berubah menjadi tanah tandus yang porak-poranda yang menyengcarakan kita semuanya. Para hadirin yang berbahagia, saat ini kita sedang menghadapi ancaman global yang tengah meningkat. Perubahan iklim telah meningkatkan intensitas badai dan topan di Amerika Serikat hingga Filipina. Sampah plastik di laut di seluruh penjuru dunia telah mencemari pasokan makanan di banyak tempat. Ancaman global yang tumbuh besar tersebut yang hanya bisa kita tanggulangi jika kita bekerja sama. Baru lima hari yang lalu dalam panel antar negara terkait perubahan iklim atau IPPCC, Bapak Antonio Guterres Sekretaris Jenderal PBB dengan tegas mengingatkan kita kembali bahwa waktu sudah sangat mendesak bagi kita untuk bertindak dalam skala besar-besaran guna mencegah kehancuran dunia akibat perubahan iklim global yang tidak terkendali. Kita perlu segera meningkatkan investasi tahunan secara global sebesar 400 persen untuk energi terbarukan. Untuk itu, kita harus bekerja bersama menyelamatkan kehidupan bersama kita. Untuk itu, kita harus bertanya, apakah sekarang kita merupakan saat yang tepat untuk rivalitas dan kompetisi? Sekali lagi, apakah sekarang ini merupakan saat yang tepat untuk rivalitas dan kompetisi? Ataukah saat ini merupakan waktu yang tepat untuk kerjasama dan kolaborasi. Apakah kita telah terlalu sibuk untuk bersaing dan menyerang satu sama lain, sehingga kita gagal menyadari adanya ancaman besar yang membayangi kita semuanya? Apakah kita gagal menyadari adanya ancaman besar yang dihadapi oleh negara kaya maupun miskin, oleh negara besar ataupun negara kecil. Para hadirin yang berbahagia, tahun depan kita akan menyaksikan season terakhir dari serial Game of Thrones.
saya bisa perkirakan bagaimana akhir ceritanya. Saya yakin ceritanya akan berakhir dengan pesan moral bahwa konfrontasi dan perselisihan akan mengakibatkan penderitaan bukan hanya bagi yang kalah, tapi juga bagi yang menang. Ketika kemenangan sudah dirayakan dan kekalahan sudah diratapi, barulah kemudian kedua-duanya sadar bahwa kemenangan maupun kekalahan dalam perang selalu hasilnya sama, yaitu dunia yang porak-poranda. Tidak ada artinya kemenangan yang dirayakan di tengah kehancuran. Tidak ada artinya menjadi kekuatan ekonomi yang terbesar di tengah dunia yang tenggelam. Saya ingin menegaskan saat ini kita masuk pada season terakhir dari pertarungan ekspansi ekonomi global yang penuh rivalitas dan persaingan. Bisa jadi situasinya lebih genting dibanding krisis finansial global 10 tahun yang lalu. Kami bergantung pada Bapak-Ibu semuanya para pembuat kebijakan moneter dan fiskal dunia untuk menjaga komitmen kerjasama global. Saya sangat berharap Bapak-Ibu akan berkontribusi dalam mendorong para pemimpin-pemimpin dunia untuk mensikapi keadaan ini secara tepat. Diperlukan kebijakan moneter dan kebijakan fiskal yang mampu menyangga dampak dari perang dagang, disrupsi teknologi, dan ketidakpastian pasar. Saya harap pertemuan tahunan kali ini berlangsung produktif. Saya harap Bapak-Ibu semuanya mampu menyerap tenaga dan memetik inspirasi indahnya alam Bali dan Indonesia. Untuk menghasilkan, untuk menghasilkan kejernian hati dan pikiran dalam memperbaiki kondisi finansial global untuk kebaikan kita bersama. Terima kasih. Assalamu'alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I think we, we all are grateful for President Choco Vidado for his excellent speech, kind and encouraging words. Once again, we would like to thank you and the people of Indonesia for their warm hospitality. I now ask all participants to stand and remain in their places while President Joko Vidado and ASEAN leaders are escorted from the plenary hall. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. The ASEAN leaders are leaving the plenary hall.
is customary in these meetings that uh, to hear first from the chairman, and I shall proceed in the same way. President Choco Vidodo, Managing Director Christine Lagarde, President Sim Yong Kim, and the fellow governors. Welcome to the annual meeting of the World Bank Group and the IMF, and the 72nd plenary of Board of Governors. Please join me once again thanking our hosts, the Indonesian government and the people of Bali for their warm hospitality. It is an honor for me and for Finland to chair this meeting. Much has changed since we last met. Global growth remains strong and unemployment has declined. Although major reforms have helped strengthen the global financial system, the effects of the global financial crisis remain. Some families still have not recovered. For many, globalization means unemployment, falling wages, and income inequality. This creates fertile ground for populism and polarization. In a world of declining trust, and limited multilateral coordination, a recession could quickly turn into other crises. There is concern that robots could be the trigger. It is estimated that millions of jobs could be lost to artificial intelligence, which could, which could hit middle to low-income workers the hardest. However, technology does not need to work against us. Managed fairly, the digital revolution has the potential to increase prosperity for all. My country, Finland, is an example of how this can be achieved. Finland has been an independent state for a hundred years. Finland has made a remarkable economic journey from one of the poorest, most agrarian countries in Europe to one of the wealthiest in the world. How did we get there? By investing in our people through health, social protection, women's rights and education. Our long-term objectives is to provide equal opportunities to high-quality education and training for all citizens. Finnish education policy is built on the principles of free education and lifelong learning. We believe that education is the key to competitiveness and well-being of the society. As Finland's experience has shown, investing in human capital not only strengthens a society's resilience, it also makes economic sense. In Finland, we value trust. It is the fundamental pillar of a functioning society. I believe trust is also what we need at the global level. Without trust, it becomes impossible to find solutions to global problems we are facing today. Without a doubt, climate change is the defining challenge of our times. 
Recent expert reports demonstrate that global warming is happening even faster than we expected. Luckily, the report also shows that we, we have the means to mitigate climate change. We just need to step up efforts, make the right political decisions, and implement them. I give you an example close to Finland. In 30 years' time, the Arctic Sea is expected to almost uh, completely ice-free in the summer, which could raise sea levels and could contribute even further to global warming. As president of Finland, Sauli Niin is warned, if we lose the Arctic, we lose the whole world. Fortunately, communities around the world are finding innovative ways to adapt. Here in Indonesia, for example, communities in Borneo and Java are responding to climate change with agroforestry. Unproductive rice paddies are being used to plant teak, which can be cut and harvested. This is good for land productivity as well as biodiversity. Of course, responding to climate change involves more than just adaption. Globally, greenhouse gas emissions are still on upward trend. Together, we must turn that trend. And there is hope. Already, more efficient use of energy and renewable energy sources are helping to reduce emissions notably. We should encourage green technologies and continued innovation, and we should discourage high emission production technologies. However, historically countries have hesitated to take an action because of concerns about negative effects on growth. The Nordic experience shows that it is possible to reduce emissions and still have healthy economic growth. Well-designed climate and energy policies can mitigate climate change while also promoting sustainable economic growth and employment. As Minister of Finance, it is important to me that we are able to come up with concrete measures that are within the competence of the Ministry of Finance. I am very pleased that Finland has taken steps to incorporate sustainable development in our budget. As one of the first countries in the world, this demonstrates how we use taxpayers' money for advancing the sustainable development goals. The threat of climate change, however, cannot be solved by each nation working alone. Country-level actions need to be complemented by multilateral efforts. The same can be said of global economy. If we don't preserve a framework for global economic coordination and cooperation, we risk reversing the gains from the open markets. The IMF and the World Bank Group have an important role to play in making globalization work better. They have created to promote global integration and economic cooperation. Today, they aim for broadly shared prosperity. Prosperity cannot be achieved by resorting to protectionism. Trade barriers and tariffs will not solve global imbalances. To, globe, to solve global challenges, we need to restore trust. Trust between citizens, trust between governments, and trust in institutions. Perhaps the greatest asset of the IMF and the World Bank Group is their culture of consensus building, which is rooted in trust. 
global consensus can only be achieved with cooperation, compromise and goodwill. I know this is not easy, but without consensus and without trust, there will be no solutions to our challenges. Thank you very much. At this time, I would like to call the Managing Director of International Monetary Fund, Madame Lagarde, to address the governors. Good morning to all of you. Selamat pagi. Excellencies, governors, guests, colleagues and friends, on behalf of the IMF, let me warmly welcome you to the 2018 annual meetings. Let me acknowledge our colleague and friend, Petteri Orpo, our new chair of the IMF Board of Governors, and my good friend, Jim Kim, who is leading our sister institution, the World Bank Group, with such great success. I want to pay tribute at this point in time to our Indonesian hosts, especially President Jokowi, Minister Luhut, Minister Sri Mulyani and Governor Perry, and also the leaders of the ASEAN countries who came to join us this morning. To all the Indonesian authorities and through you, to all the Indonesian people, thank you so much for hosting us. We are all aware of Indonesia's remarkable performance over the last generation. Reducing poverty, raising income, and integrating rapidly within the global economy. In recent days, I have been incredibly impressed by Indonesia's courage and resilience in the face of the natural disasters that hit successively Lombok and Sulawesi. On behalf of the IMF, let me offer once again our sympathy and our condolences to those who have lost their loved ones. And you know what? Despite all that, while they were working so hard, day and night, to alleviate the suffering brought about by those tragedies, despite all that, they have continued to show everyone their kindness their generosity, their hospitality, and that gracious spirit that is so well embodied in the smiles that you see all the time. And it is actually that spirit and those smiles that I saw on the face of the people of Lombok when I visited a few days ago. It is the spirit of Indonesia. So from the bottom of my heart, Thank you, and from all of us, thank you. I was going to add thank you also to President Jokowi for raising the bar of excellence and conviction in delivering a speech. Wow. We are just failed attempts of delivering a similar message now. Now, there is a wonderful tradition in Bali called Kanong Sari, whereby people offer something of value to the gods to give thanks and to ask for continued blessings. And I think we are here trying to do something similar. We have come to Bali from all corners of the world to make an offering, offering of our work together the 189 member countries of the Bretton Woods institutions, and it could hardly be more timely. Yes, the global economy continues to grow strongly, but this growth is spread unevenly across regions and people, and it is plateauing. Some risks 
are beginning to materialize. Risks to the economic stability and prosperity. Risks to the principles and institutions that underpin international cooperation, which has delivered so many benefits to so many people for so many years. Not so long ago, as President Jokowi reminded us, it was that very cooperation that helped bring the world back from the brink of the global financial crisis. And it continues in this region, in the ASEAN region, to bring about many benefits because of that cooperation. And that cooperative approach that is adopted by the ASEAN offers important lessons for now. Why is that? Because as we look at the world today, we face the challenge of a new economic landscape, one that I would characterize as a landscape in two dimensions. The first dimension, quite familiar to many of us, includes the monetary, fiscal, and financial layers of our economic interactions. The second dimension, more challenging, comprises inequality, technology, and sustainability. And both dimensions are macro-critical. In tackling these problems, sound domestic policies are of course essential, but navigating this new landscape requires international cooperation, and a cooperation that is slightly different from the past. I call it new multilateralism. It has to be more inclusive, more people-centered, and more results-oriented. Let me try to explain what I mean by that. First, the more familiar macroeconomic challenges, the first dimension, if you will. Let me take three examples. Think of trade, the very lifeblood of our economies. Even though trade cooperation has driven an unprecedented period of growth and prosperity over the last 70 plus years. Today, it faces a backlash, partly because too many people have been left out. We estimate that escalation of current trade tensions could reduce global GDP by almost 1% over the next two years. Clearly, we need to de-escalate these disputes. But just as clearly, we need to reform the global trade system to make it even better, fairer, stronger, mutually beneficial to all nations and all people and fit for the future. But that means fixing the system together, not tearing it apart. The same is true for global imbalances. We know that large current account deficits mirror large current account surpluses. So protecting economic stability requires that excess, deficit, and surplus countries work in a cooperative way. The IMF's most recent external sector report underscored that very point. Third example, related challenge actually rising vulnerability to debt. We noted recently that public and private debt has hit a record of $182 billion. That is 224% of global GDP, 60% more than what we had in 2007. Well, some people would argue that doesn't matter. It does matter. It does matter. And as financial conditions tighten as they will, the wind could shift, especially for the emerging markets, causing a reversal of capital flows. And this could easily accelerate and spill across borders with real actual impact on people. So to prevent this, countries' domestic policies need to be complemented by a global financial safety net. Some of the resources could come from regional financing arrangements, like the Chiangmang Initiative, for instance. And they could come together with the institution that is so often called upon to help in tough times, the IMF. 
So ensuring that the fund has the needed resources requires international cooperation. It is solidarity, but it is also about self-interest. The principles of cooperation run through all of the fund's work. Lending, surveillance, capacity development, it runs through all the policy advice and support that we provide to you, our members. From financial regulatory reform to public debt transparency, from capital flow management to anti-money laundering. In today's hyper-connected world, no country can manage these issues alone. We need cooperation, and cooperation is in the fund's DNA. Let me now turn to the second dimension. Changing economic landscape, inequality, technology, sustainability. Those are not new issues. But what is new is that they're much more interwoven and fast moving than ever. Responding to this dimension is vital for economic stability and prosperity. But again, responding effectively can only be done through cooperation. Let me take those two elements. Take inequality. The IMF research tells us that less inequality is associated with stronger, more sustainable growth. At the same time, excessive inequality is associated with marginalized people, damaged communities, and eroded trust. So no wonder people feel angry and disenfranchised. Tackling inequality will require partnership. It requires government, private sector, civil society working together to do what? Well, to eradicate the discrimination against women, to design the right labor market reforms, to strengthen education, training, and social protection system, to include people, not exclude them, and prepare them for the future of those technological transformations. Let's take technology. We know that the digital revolution presents both great promise and great peril. Biotech, robotics, artificial intelligence, just to name a few, will create new industries, new jobs. But this transition will also disrupt and disenfranchise. So we must be attentive and preemptive on the effects of, on people. FinTech that we discussed yesterday and that President Jokowi certainly encouraged us to look at very carefully to identify the principles that should be identified as key for each of you when you draw you pieces of legislation. FinTech certainly has the potential to unleash economic dynamism, reduce poverty, especially by providing financial services to 1.7 billion people around the world who do not have access to banking services today. And it can do many more things. But it, need, it needs to be managed carefully to protect financial stability and safety. And since digital means global, this will require new domestic efforts, but also multilateral cooperation. And I'm really encouraged that at these meetings, together with the World Bank, we were able to provide those 12 elements of the Bali FinTech agenda to help guide you in those endeavors. Let's take now sustainability. Addressing the increasing negative effects of climate change is a common priority, an imperative that can only be met through common action. The same applies to the broader agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals, our common aspiration for a better world for all. We just recently, at the request of the UN Secretary General, estimated that the additional spending needed for low-income countries alone to achieve the SDGs in key sectors such as health, education, water, sanitation, and infrastructure, that alone is about five 120 billion per year by 2030. There is no way that that gap can be filled only by those countries alone. It will need them, it will need the private sector, it will need the international institutions, it will need the donors and the philanthropists as well. 
And this partnership, sure, must extend to more efficient resource management, strengthening revenue collection, including by curbing, cur curbing tax avoidance and evasion and stamping out corruption. This kind of partnership is integral to the new multilateralism, not least because tensions arising from exclusions and climate change just ignore national borders, parliament, legislative processes. And in that sense, solidarity here is also self-interest. The new multilateralism must also be inclusive open to diverse views and voices. It must be more people-oriented, putting human needs first. And it must be more effective and accountable, delivering results for all. The IMF is at the heart of this new multilateralism. And I want to take this opportunity to thank my fantastic management colleagues, to thank the esteemed executive directors and our just incredible staff who work day and night to actually deliver services for you. And the volume of those services is in constant demand, so I have no doubt that they actually serve their purpose. Thank you very much. It's a bit unusual to do what I'm going to do now, but it's a way to recognize everybody's contribution. And I want to, on this occasion, say thank you to all those members of staff, World Bank and IMF, who have actually contributed a lot in the recent years and whose meeting in Bali is their last meeting. And I want to, in our team, particularly recognize, among others, our economic counselor who is retiring, Maury Opsfeld, who has been an intellectual leader I don't know many other people who are as committed as he is to multilateralism, actually. So let me conclude. I've tried to explain what I meant by this two-dimension economic landscape. But I want to finish with some ancient wisdom found in Bhagavad Gita. And it says, in all actions, consider the common good. If we do this, if we commit to this common good, the blessing of our work together from our offering will be returned to benefit not only our generation, but generations to come. And speaking of future generations, I want to acknowledge a few very special people here. I hope you've been happily distracted from my speech by some beautiful images as I was speaking. And you might wonder what they are. Well, they are the winning photos of an Instagram contest that we held among ASEAN youth. Every picture tells a story, a story of the anxieties and the hopes of this region's rising generation. So let us remember that this new multilateralism that I hope for is intended for them. And I would like Hira, Kevin, Mohamed, and Rexor, who are with us in this room, to stand and be recognized. Thank you. Thank you, and Terry Makassi. Thank you, Madame Lacarde. And at this time, I would like to call the president of the World Bank Group, Dr. Kim, to address the governors. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Chairman Orpo, uh, all 
our good friends here from, from, uh, from Indonesia, especially my friend Paluhut, and, and of course my dear, dear friend uh, Sri Mulyani Indrawati. Uh, Christine, wonderful speech, thank you very much. And I want to welcome everybody also to the uh, 2018 IMF World Bank Group annual meetings. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be here. And it's also wonderful to receive such a warm welcome. I, I have to uh, admit that when I heard uh, President Jokowi's speech, I thought it's probably time for us all to go home. We can't do much better than that. And then I had to follow Christine. So please, some compassion. But uh, to start out, um, I'd like to address directly, as myself, a, a son of Asia, I'd like to ad address directly the people of, uh, of Indonesia. A very good morning. I convey my deepest condolences for the loss of lives and the damages caused in central Sulawesi and Lombok. All of us from the World Bank Group will fully support the government and the people of Indonesia. Thank you, I worked on that quite a bit. <laughs> we stand shoulder to shoulder with Indonesia. Indonesians are resilient and compassionate people, and they will rise from this challenge stronger than ever. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our governors, our board, our executive directors especially, and our dedicated staff around the world for delivering last, uh, uh, last April an historic capital increase that just passed for the IBRD. We want everyone to know that we take your confidence in us very, very seriously. And it gives us more resources uh, to tackle the biggest problems that our clients face, like the tragedies that struck Indonesia this year. The natural disasters in Lombok and Sulawesi are a reminder of why we gather here every year. We have to agree on ways forward in tackling the biggest uh, challenges. How can we help our clients build resilience to natural disasters such as earthquakes and tsunamis and tackle the climate shocks that exacerbate them? How can countries manage debt levels so they don't stifle economic growth? How do we help countries invest in their people and prepare for an increasingly complex future? And above all, what will it take to promote economic growth and accelerate poverty reduction everywhere in the world? We've gathered here this week to share new ideas and approaches to answer these questions and to accelerate progress toward our twin goals, to end extreme poverty by 2030 and to boost shared prosperity among the poorest 40% around the world. Our biennial poverty and shared prosperity report, which we will release next week, shows how much progress we've made and how much further we have to go. Over the last 25 years, more than one billion people have lifted themselves out of extreme poverty. The global poverty rate is around 10%, the lowest it's ever been in recorded history. This is one of the great achievements of our time, but 736 million people still live on less than $1.90 a day. A quarter of the world's population lives on less than $3.20 a day, which of course is the lower middle-income country poverty level. And nearly half the people in the world live on less than $5.50 a day, which is the poverty level in high middle-income countries. The pace of poverty reduction, unfortunately, is also slowing, which means that we have to accelerate our efforts on the three pillars of our, of our strategy to achieve our twin goals. First, to drive inclusive, sustainable economic growth by crowding in private sector investment, by helping countries manage debt levels, and by harnessing the power of technology like FinTech. Second, to build resilience to shocks and threats by taking urgent action on climate change. And I'm very proud to announce that we uh, surpassed our goal for climate benefits in our portfolio, and we're already at 32% this year. We have to also, as we've seen here in Indonesia, help our client countries share the risks, and disas risks of disasters with the capital markets. 
And finally, we have to help countries invest more and more effectively in their people to prepare for what's certain to, certain to be a more digitally demanding future. The final pillar has been our focus for much of the past year. We're approaching this, uh, this struggle, this, this challenge, with what Martin Luther King used to call a fierce sense of urgency because of two overarching trends that we're seeing in every region. First, aspirations, as everyone in this room knows, are rising all over the world. Smartphones, the internet, and social media allow nearly everyone to know how everyone else lives. Our economists found that when you get access to the internet and smartphones, uh, what changes is people's reference income, the income to which they compare their own. And this is a powerful accelerator of aspirations. And there's little question that aspirations will continue to rise. Uh, some studies estimate that by 2025, all 8 billion people on Earth would have access to broadband, and nearly everyone will be able to have access to a smartphone. The second major trend, of course, is that technology is changing the nature of work, and this is what we outlined in our World Development Report this year. The focus, uh, the, the focus of our World Development Report. Technology and automation are replacing scores of tasks and doing away with some jobs. Innovation is also changing the scope of existing jobs, creating new occupations, and launching career fields that didn't exist just a few years ago. So if technology is helping raise aspirations and changing the nature of work, we're going to have to answer some very difficult questions. What are people going to do? How will they support their families? How will they reach their ambitions in an increasingly technolog technologically complex world? The good news is that we know more than ever about how countries can help, uh, can prepare for this future. The key is making the right investments in people ensuring that they, have, uh, they, they accumulate the health, knowledge, and skills they need to realize their full potential. Yesterday, we announced a new tool to help make the case for those investments, the first human capital index from the World Bank Group. It's a summary measure of the human capital that a child born today can expect to attain by age 18, given the risks of poor health and poor education in the country where that child lives. The index focuses on outcomes, not inputs, in three components. First, survival. What is the probability that a child born today will survive to age five? Second, in school. How, much will, how many years of school will they complete? And most importantly, how much will they learn during those years of school? And third, health. Will a child, will a child be stunted before the age of five? And will they be healthy into adulthood, ready for work, with a foundation for lifelong learning. I'm sure you've seen the numbers, so let me explain what they mean. We examined the contributions of health and education to the productivity, and then, of course, economic growth uh, possibilities of the next generation of workers. Every country falls into a range between zero and one. A one is only possible if a child born today can expect to achieve full health, which is defined as no stunting and survival up to at least age 60, and complete education, which is 14 years of high quality school by age 18. That means that if a country scores 0.70 in the index, the future earnings potential of children born today will be 30% lower than what they could have achieved at the frontier with complete education and full health. With the Human Capital Index, we're working to change the conversation around human capital. For the last few decades, we relied on donors and emotional appeals to invest in the next generation. The appeals worked, and financing for global health and education increased dramatically from what was, of course, a low base. We've had enormous successes like PEPFAR, the Global Fund, but these efforts and even a dramatic expansion of ODA won't solve the problem. The index draws a direct line between better health and education outcomes and future economic growth. It paints a very clear picture for leaders of how much more productive their workers could be with full health, a complete education, and the skills needed in the future. For example, if a country has a score of 0.50, the future GDP per worker could be twice as high if the country reached the frontier. Over the course of 50 years, 
This works out to 1.4% of GDP per year lost to that country. Building human capital takes time, but in the long term, it pays off in faster growth and better poverty reduction. We've simulated what would happen if all countries improve their human capital outcomes at rates equivalent to the top quartile uh, of good performers over the past decade. At this ambitious but entirely realistic uh, uh, pace, global poverty in 2050 could be nearly half of what it would be if countries don't make these improvements. The benefits, of course, would, would be concentrated in low- and middle-income countries. So far, 28 countries, including our host, Indonesia, have signed on as early adopters of our human capital project. And we're working with them to close gaps and design countrywide plans to improve health and learning. Here are a few very exciting examples. Peru is committing to raising tax revenue to improve health and education outcomes by 2021, just a few years. They set a goal to achieve 95% enrollment of children in preschool and near universal health coverage. These commitments build on Peru's success reducing childhood stunting. In 2008, 28% of children in Peru were stunted. The World Bank supported a strong country-led program that used cash transfers in targeted communities to support poor mothers and ensure that their young children had proper nutrition and stimulation. In just seven years, Peru cut the stunting rate in half to just 14%. We're now taking lessons from Peru and helping to apply them around the world, including here in Indonesia. Poland, a high-income country uh, economy that's working with us on human capital development, has valuable lessons to share. Poland's education reforms at the start of the century produced enormous improvements in student learning. The most notable policy is three years of comprehensive secondary school for all students before they move into vocational or academic tracks. As a direct result of this reform, between 2000 and 2006, Poland moved from below the OECD average on PISA scores to, to, to the, the number nine country in the entire world. Ethiopia is emerging from a period of political and social crisis. In his inaugural address, Prime Minister Abe said that one of the key solutions to the country's problems is to be found in education. He pledged to redouble the government's efforts with absolute determination to focus on education quality. We're prepared to work with the Prime Minister, Abi, to support human capital development alongside important economic reforms. Egypt, in a remarkable story, reduced regressive energy subsidies to make human capital investments across the board. Four years ago, subsidies for energy were 6.6% of GDP more than the government spent on health, education, and social protection combined. We help bring in the private sector, bring in private sector investment to transition to solar energy, which increased the government's fiscal space by around $14 billion. Egypt used resources to roll out two new cash transfer programs that now reach 9.5 million people. They also increased food subsidies for the poorest by 300%, and expanded school meals programs, which covers now 12 million children. Egypt started a system-wide transformation of its health, education, and rural sanitation systems, including changing incentives to produce better outcomes. The last annual meetings, President Paul Kagame helped make the case for human capital, and Rwanda has made the reduction of stunting a national priority. The country's targeting children under two years old in districts with the highest burden of stunting rolling out mass media and radio campaigns to raise awareness, and using conditional grants through its flagship social protection project to improve the delivery of health and nutrition services. Rwanda is also strengthening its mechanisms to hold authorities accountable for results at all levels of government. Indonesia set ambitious targets for reducing stunting from 33% to 22% by 2022. The government's falling through with financing reforms, including taxes on tobacco, to collect more resources for human capital investments. In July, I visited Dakung in central Lombok with Vice President Kala and other leaders in the Indonesian government. This is one of 31 districts where they're testing a new grassroots approach to delivering key health and education services. I visited with human development workers 
measuring the growth of babies using length, uh, using length mats to, to measure the length of children. And I'm told now that the awareness of stunting has grown tremendously in this community. The workers counseled pregnant women and mothers on nutrition and interacted with young children in an early childhood development program. The World Bank helped design this pilot, again with insights from Peru, and will support its expansion throughout the country. Working across the whole of government, Indonesia has committed $3.9 billion per year and to action from 22 different ministries. Earlier this year, President Jokowi said, and I quote, we often talk about the wealth of our natural resources, but we seem to neglect the fact that Indonesia has great power in the form of human resources. This is truly the biggest and strongest capital in our possession. Building Indonesian people is our investment to face the future. As all leaders face that future, they have more tools than ever to help build human capital. By raising aspirations and changing the nature of work, technology makes investments in people ever more urgent. But it also gives us new ways to improve outcomes in health and education. Over the last uh, few months, I've made it my top priority to learn from innovators all over the world. In the past month, I visited Silicon Valley twice. And we invited top innovators here to Bali to showcase how technology can accelerate progress toward financial inclusion uh, in terms of the, uh, our fintech agenda and also to improve human capital. For example, there's an app called MindSpark, which uses millions of data points from student tests to figure out common problems, and the program designs remedial exercises for each student. This platform has helped 80,000 students across India improve math and Hindi skills for a fraction of the cost of attending school. There's a digital health startup called Babylon, which, uh, which developed a mobile app that uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to set up virtual consultations with doctors and health professionals. In Rwanda, more than two million people use the app, about 30% of the population. Last spring, Babylon announced a partnership with WeChat in China, where one billion users would be able to get instant health care advice through their mobile phones. But of course, it's not just about health and education, it's also about jobs. Today, we're announcing a new partnership with Stripe, who's here at our innovation fair, showcasing how their technology supports millions of entrepreneurs around the world. Together, we will survey entrepreneurs from over 100 countries to better understand from the ground up the legal, regulatory, and bureaucratic bottlenecks for companies doing digital business. And the policies, much more importantly, understand what the policies are that will help digital entrepreneurship thrive. We will eventually incorporate these insights into our doing business report. Even the top performing countries cannot let up in their efforts to build human capital. Singapore, the number one country on the human capital index, the country closest to the frontier, is continuing to improve its education system to teach what they call 21st century competencies, such as self-awareness, responsible decision-making, and focus on universal early childhood education. The initiative builds on Prime Minister Lee Shen Lung's commitment to making health and education national priorities. In his, two, in his 2017 National Day Address, Prime Minister Lee said the goal was to, quote, build our future so that Singaporeans can start right, stay healthy, and live smart at every age. All world leaders, and especially ministers of finance, must take the same approach. Invest in your people with a fierce sense of urgency. As innovation continues to accelerate, it will be harder to catch up. Every day that you don't focus on building human capital, your economy and your country will fall, fall further and further behind. This is the economic reality of our time. And it's also, for me, very personal. I was born in South Korea in 1959, when it was one of the poorest countries in the world. In fact, the World Bank uh, would not give Korea a loan until 1962, because before that, they felt that it would be impossible for Korea to pay a loan back. It the first loan was in 1962, and it was for a railroad. But the second loan, a few years later, was for education. And they received some derision from bank staff for taking a second loan on education. But Korea kept investing in education. The country's constitution and laws made primary school mandatory. 
In 1945, 54, only 54% of Korean children were enrolled in primary school. By the time I was born in 59, 96%. In the 1960s, Korea made it possible to attend middle school without taking a test. By 74, the government had a policy of standardizing high school education. The Korean government then drew up a five-year plan for science and technology education in the 1960s in tandem with this five-year economic plan. Today, South Korea's literacy rate is nearly 98%. And in the last 37 years, the GDP has increased 47-fold. Investments in people can transform lives, livelihoods, and the trajectories of entire countries if they are made an urgent priority. As, thank you. As we work to drive economic growth, accelerate the reduction of poverty, and build human capital, we would do well to follow the words of former Indonesian President Sukarno from more than half a century ago. In 1955, Indonesia hosted the Asia-Africa Conference in Bandung, a meeting of 25, excuse me, 29 newly independent countries, which between them represented roughly half the world's population. President Sukarno challenged the leaders not to be guided by fear, but instead, and I quote, be guided by hopes and determination, be guided by ideals, and yes, be guided by dreams. Our dream is a world free of poverty, and we've never been closer. We've never been closer to realizing that dream, but none of us can hide from the stark reality of this human capital crisis. Generations from now, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren will ask, what did you do when you knew just how critical investments in human capital were for my future, my world? What did you do when you found out that improving health and education could change billions of lives and the course of entire countries? Did you commit to ending childhood stunting? Did you enhance learning for every child? Did you ensure that everyone has access to health care and a chance to lead a long, healthy life? Did you prepare young people for the jobs of the future? If we don't act now to answer those questions, I fear that rising aspirations will be met with frustration and more countries could go down the path of fragility, conflict, violence, extremism, and eventually migration. Given how quickly aspirations are rising, we won't just have Arab Springs, we'll have African Springs, South Asian Springs, Latin American Springs, and the list will go on. For the leaders of the world, especially heads of state and ministers of finance, now that we know the importance of these investments for productivity and economic growth, we have no excuse but to act with a sense of urgency that this crisis requires to invest in our people. We have the data. I've described innovative, transformational examples of how countries have succeeded and will succeed. Now, as many of you know, I've been working for most of my adult life to provide complex medical care and education at all levels in some of the poorest places on Earth. Today, I'm here to tell you that we can do this. We, and it very well may be, for the people in this room, it very well may be the most important thing you do to prepare your country for the future, to give every child everywhere in the world a chance to reach for the stars. Terima kasih. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Let us now turn to the formal business of the institutions. We have before us the reports and recommendations of Joint Procedures Committee. Report 1 covers business of the fund. Report 2 covers business of the bank, IFC and IDA. Report 3 concerns matters of common interest to all the organizations. We also have the report of the Procedures Committee of the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency. On the re recommendations of the GPC and MPC, I propose the adoption of these reports and the recommendations contained therein. Second. 
As there is no objection, the reports and re recommendations are adopted. <laughs> on matters related on the International Center of Settlement of in Investment Disputes, I ask Dr. Kim, as chairman of ICSID's Administrative Council, to take the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm honored to open this uh, 52nd annual meeting of the ICSID Administrative Council. Two weeks ago, ICSID held an extremely productive consultation with member states, which ultimately led to updated rules for investor state dispute settlement. During this consultation, states expressed appreciation of ICSID's role in mobilizing private finance for development. For today, there are only two items on the ICSID agenda, which call for the adoption of resolutions by the Council to approve the 2018 ICSID annual report and to adopt the administrative budget for fiscal year 2019. The draft resolutions have been distributed to members. I propose that the draft resolutions on the ICSID 2018 annual report and the ICSID administrative budget for fiscal year 2019 be adopted. Without objection, the resolutions are adopted. I hereby adjourn the 2018 annual meeting of ICSID's Administrative Council. I thank Dr. Kim. Before adjourning this session, I propose that we resolve to record our appreciation to the host of the 2018 Bali meetings and to convey that the boards of governors of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank Group express their sincere appreciation to the government of the people of Indonesia for this gracious and warm hospitality during these annual meetings. That they express particular appreciation to the governors and alternate governors for Indonesia and to their associates for the many contributions they made toward ensuring the success of the 2018 annual meetings. Without objection, we will record our declaration of appreciation. I thank the governors of the bank, the fund and the bank for the honor to have served as a chairman of this joint session. And I thank you for your support and cooperation. Allow me also express my deep appreciation to Madame Lacarde and Dr. Kim for their leadership of our two institutions. I also appreciate the commitment of the staff of the fund and the bank for carrying out the vital work of these institutions. I would like to thank Mr. Lin and Mrs. Chiakata, as well as the staff of Secretariat of both institutions, for the successful organization of the meeting. I would also like to thank the two vice chairmen, the governors for Ghana and Indonesia. I wish to congratulate the governor for Fiji, who has been selected to chair for the coming year. I wish, I wish all the governors and delegates are, are a uh, fruitful and productive meetings period over the next few days and a safe journey home after the completion of, our, of your work. I look forward to seeing you next year in Washington, D.C. I hereby adjourn this meeting of the 2018 annual meetings of the Boards of Governors of the IMF and the IBRD, IDA, IFC, and MIGA. Thank you.
pemirsa KMNQ Corpo TV baru saja kita saksikan bersama annual meeting plenary yang disiarkan dari Bali Nusa 2 Convention Center. Selanjutnya kita akan melangkah ke penayangan event pilihan berikutnya yaitu Investing for Positive Impact, What is Needed to Scale Up Dialog. Dalam pertemuan ini akan dipertemukan para manajer aset, pemilik aset dan juga berbagai lembaga pembiayaan pembangunan untuk mendiskusikan dan berbagi wawasan mereka dalam berinvestasi dan juga bagaimana pola investasi di masa depan yang mengedepankan impact management principles for investors untuk menggerakkan pasar menjadi lebih transparan, konsisten, dan juga kredibel. Presiden World Bank Group, Jim Yong Kim, akan menjadi pembicara pada event ini bersama CEO-CEO perusahaan dan juga lembaga pembiayaan dunia lainnya. Event ini sendiri akan berakhir pada pukul 12.30 waktu Indonesia Tengah dan setelah break sholat Jumat nanti, pastikan Anda kembali bersama kami, KMNQ Corpo TV, untuk mengikuti event berikutnya yaitu wawancara eksklusif kami bersama Kepala Badan Pendidikan dan Pelatihan Keuangan sebagai pelaksana harian 2 annual meeting saya MMP Bank Group 2018, Bapak Rionald Silaban. Dan dilanjutkan dengan Disrupting Development, How Digital Platforms and Innovation Are Changing the Future of Developing Nation Seminar yang tentunya tidak akan ingin Anda lewatkan karena seorang tokoh dunia, pendiri e-commerce terbesar dunia Alibaba, Jack Ma, akan menjadi salah satu pembicaranya. Baik, pemirsa KMNQ Corpo TV dari kawasan Nusa Dua Bali kami ucapkan selamat menyaksikan Investing for Positive Impact.